Hi, it's Roland Jones. Thanks for joining us on another slideshow on clawback related issues. We're going to be covering in this slideshow sanctions, um, specifically uh, 911 sanctions or under the bankruptcy rules 9011 sanctions. And most of the cases deal with the issue of whether a trustee has um, uh, by filing a clawback action, uh, has he acted uh, sanctionably? Was he frivolous in not doing enough research into affirmative defenses? first case we're going to look at is, is a Seventh Circuit case. It's a Court of Appeals case. It's the highest uh, court that's looked at this issue. Uh, it's a 1992, 1992 case. Um, and we'll look at more recent cases later at the bankruptcy court level, but this is the highest court that's addressed this particular issue. So in this case, we have a Chicago attorney suing on behalf of a debtor. Uh, for a preference clawback. Um, he's suing on behalf of Excello Press. He's suing associated agencies, apparently for insurance premiums that were paid by the debtor in the 90-day period. So uh, uh, what happened here is that uh, uh, the defendant associated eventually moved for summary judgment and uh, they won based on ordinary course of business. Uh, 547 uh, C2. So the bankruptcy court granted associates motion. Uh, they're done, uh, but they're not too happy because their argument is, hey, why was this, why was this lawsuit even brought? Uh, he had all the information, he meaning uh, the attorney for the, uh, for the debtor. Why did he bring this case? He knew we had defenses because he, he could figure it out by, uh, by the information he had already. And this is, a, this is a very hot issue. And the reason it's so hot is that it, it's extremely annoying on, on, for defendants uh, when, when it seems clear that the, the attorney for the trustee or the attorney for the debtor um, has all the information, can see that there's an, should see that there's an ordinary course defense, and it brings an action anyway. And then we have to show that the, uh, our affirmative defenses when, uh, and it makes it almost worse when summary judgment is granted and, and the, the thought running through the, the, the minds of the defense counsel and the, and the defense counsel's client is, why was this case brought? Uh, he had all the information uh, to tell that there were good defenses here. So this is frivolous, it's to rack up, uh, to churn legal fees, etc., etc. Um, so that's sort of the context to this to this type of sanctions motion. Okay, so associated uh, uh, feeling some annoyance as I just described, um, makes a motion for sanctions at the bankruptcy rule nine zero one one, which we'll look at in a second, and it basically mimics nine one one of the federal rules of several civil procedure. And the bankruptcy court agreed, said, hey, you know, this is, uh, this is sanctionable conduct. Uh, 
Mr. Mr. Zazoff, uh, you wasted everybody's time. And uh, the amount at stake, the, the amount at stake was was around eleven thousand, and the judge sanctioned uh, this attorney for around eleven thousand. Maybe, maybe a little ironic uh, comment there. Uh, I, I I'm sure it was must have been based on uh, legal cost as as proven by uh, the defendant uh, counsel, but the, the amount was almost the same, and it was a relatively small amount that the defendant was being sued for. So the bankruptcy, the, the, bank, the bankruptcy judge said, you know what, this is sanctionable because um, uh, you didn't undertake uh, adequate investigation. Um, also, besides ordinary course, there was another uh, defense that I'm not going to go into in detail uh, regarding um, uh, whether the defendant was an initial transferee or not. Uh, so that was just uh, icing on the cake. Uh, you should have uh, read uh, this circuit's recent decision, and then you would have uh, you would have dis you would have uh, dismissed that case. Uh, that that you would have dismissed the claim as to that transfer. But it doesn't really matter since apparently they were all covered by the ordinary course defense anyway. So the district court. Uh, affirm the entry of sanctions, saying, uh, "Mr. Mr. Attorney, you, you should have you should have done some uh, investigation, and and not brought this. We agree, uh, but we're going to reverse the sanctions with respect to not dismissing the complaint with respect to a third transfer because um, the uh, the statute does not impose post filing duties, just pre filing duties. So based on that." Um, uh, we're going to reverse just that. So it was sent back to bankruptcy court to reduce the award and, um, and the attorney appealed to the court of appeals. So the issues are pretty clear. Should, should, uh, this, uh, attorney be sanctioned for not conducting an adequate pre-filing investigation? And what, what's also what you have to realize is that these are defenses. These are affirmative defenses that belong to the defendant. So the, 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 the concept, um, the argument on Zazov's side is, hey, you know, I, I, I fulfilled uh, all the requirements uh, that I need. I've proved all the elements that I need to prove uh, under 547 uh, to win this case. Why, why, why would I possibly have a burden to take a look at the affirmative defenses. That's not, that's not my responsibility. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, it's certainly reasonable not to have to look, why, why should I have to deal with defenses? It's not, it's not, it's not my job. Uh, also the, uh, the, uh, defendant here, uh, undoubtedly, uh, getting more and more annoyed, <laughs> especially at this third level of appeal. Uh, asked the Court of Appeals for sanctions under 28 U.S.C. 927, basically saying, hey, now that, you know, the, the lawyer is being vexatious and he's multiplying proceedings uh, vexatiously and he's just, uh, is just a further example of wasting everybody's uh, time and money and he should be sanctioned for that, that under uh, 927. So this is the applicable uh, statute, Federal Rule of Bankruptcy Procedure 9011, and uh, highlighted the relevant, what I thought were the relevant sections, um, representations to the court. Um, they have to be made after a reasonable inquiry under the circumstances. And this case is all about, you know, what is that? What does that mean? Uh, claims have to be based on some kind of existing law or non-frivolous argument for the extension, modification, reversal of existing law. You can't just make up stuff and make arguments that make, that make no sense. Uh, three is uh, you can't make up facts. <laughs> they have to have some kind of evidentiary support. Uh, denial of facts need to be based on some kind of evidence. I mean, it's all common sense stuff. Uh, 
you can't waste you, you can't you, you, you can't make up stuff and you can't waste everybody's time with frivolous nonsense essentially that's that's my interpretation of the statute this is 927 you can't harass people and waste everybody's time and money uh, in, in a frivolous way um, uh, unreasonably and vexatiously you can't be vexatious love that like it so much I highlighted it so to summarize on appeal uh, Zazoff is, is saying uh, the district court was wrong uh, number one I have no duty to investigate potential affirmative defenses uh, it's not my job and I shouldn't have that obligation even if I did have that obligation which I, I did not uh, I did the right thing. I conducted a reasonable pre-filing investigation and uh, I shouldn't be sanctioned. Zazov asked the court to adopt a per se rule saying 9011 sections can never be uh, applied for a counsel's failure to investigate an affirmative defense. It's not my job, period. Well, this is what the court ruled. First of all, the court says uh, we're, we're not going to adopt the per se rule. It's a case by case uh, analysis. It's a question of line drawing. What's, re what's a reasonable inquiry? Uh, we've got to look at the facts. We've got to look at the circumstances. And then we're going to make a decision. And so the court rejected the argument uh, that it's not the burden of a, uh, an attorney representing a plaintiff in a clawback case, especially a preference case, if you're going to restrict the facts to preference clawbacks, um, that uh, uh, the lawyer does have a job, does have a responsibility to look at affirmative defenses, may have a responsibility, depending on the circumstances. The court's saying, well, you know, normally uh, there's probably not going to be much of a pre filing investigation. Uh, that's required but not all the time if it's obvious uh, he's going to have to take that into account so w what does all that mean for this particular case what does it mean in general what kind of guidance is that sometimes yes sometimes no maybe not that much limited guidance well here the court says that it imposes a in my opinion, a pretty significant, uh, uh, pretty significant uh, duty here. Uh, what the what the court is saying is that Zazov um, had an obligation to look at the uh, ordinary course defense. He had he had the uh, facts available, uh, the evidence available when they paid um, um, the consistency between the preference period and the and a comparison period. And he had an obligation to look at that. To me, that's not that obvious, but the court found that to be obvious. Uh, if he's got that information uh, and it's and there's an obvious ordinary course defense, uh, he may be barred from bringing the action as, as frivolous unless he can make a reasonable argument that the ordinary course defense doesn't apply. He should have an argument prepared. And this assumes the information is, is in his control. It does not require uh, any kind of discovery or pre-filing discovery. It just requires that the that Zazov and, and any attorney, any plaintiff counsel in a preference clawback case, take a look at uh, take a look at the evidence. Can't just ignore it um, and see if there's an obvious uh, ordinary course defense. Uh, my experience is that. There's very rarely an obvious ordinary course defense. So um, it's, a, it's a question for me as to how useful this decision really is. Uh, there's often an obvious subsequent new value defense. Uh, there may be uh, an obvious contemporary exchange defense, but there's still an open question of what's obvious. But I think this is enough to put uh, a lawyer for a plaintiff on notice that uh, he's got to be careful and he's got to review uh, the evidence. So 
So to go into a little bit more detail, um, the court noted that the debtor did possess the evidence. Uh, there was a Zonix decision uh, that postulated that if the um, uh, if the payments by the debtor were late during the preference period, then it's uh, probably that, that 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 would probably take it out of the ordinary course. But really, what that did uh, was create a rebuttable presumption. And the, sever the, the Seventh Circuit concluded that uh, the presumption was rebutted in this case because there was consistency between the parties. And the whole point being that there, there cert certainly was the makings of an ordinary course defense here. So the court seemed to imply that based on that uh, alone, uh, if that were the only factor, Zazov maybe shouldn't have brought this action. Um, however, that wasn't the only, it wasn't the only issue. Uh, at that time, uh, before 2005, uh, uh, defendants were required to also uh, prove 547C2C. Um, that's, it, now the majority decision, the, the majority uh, of cases uh, are of the opinion that that code section requires um, uh, a showing of the industry standard. What's what's ordinary course for the industry at the time of this? At the time of not even the court of not even this court of appeals decision, but at the time of the bankruptcy court decision, it wasn't so clear what this meant um, and whether uh, uh, whether um, this just meant the ordinary course between the parties. And Zazov argued, hey, in my uh, pre-falling investigation, uh, I took a look at this and I don't, I have no clue what the industry standard is. I don't have that, 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 that evidence or information in my possession. So, so that, that's enough uh, for me to have uh, brought this action because I could have won the case just on uh, the defendant's uh, failure to meet uh, their burden under 547C2C. I don't know if they're going to meet it or not, uh, what the ordinary course for the industry is. And the Seventh Circuit basically agreed uh, with Zazov saying, uh, well, you know, this was a, a reasonable uh, uh, argument that uh, uh, Zazov didn't have this kind of information in his possession. He's not required to do discovery. And so, uh, the, 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 and, and so the point is, it's not up. The defendant did not have an obvious defense. It could have lost could have won, who knows. And so the, sev the Seventh Circuit concluded uh, that Zazov should not have been sanctioned um, uh, on this argument. But what, what I take away here is that the Seventh Circuit is saying Zazov uh, uh, had a close call. Um, and now, uh, after 2005, the industry standard is, is not required. Uh, uh, defendants uh, can choose either or um, or both as far as uh, 547 uh, C2B or C. Uh, so would this have had the same result uh, under the current law? I don't know. Maybe maybe Zazov would have been sanctioned. Um, so it, it certainly, I think it certainly puts a plaintiff counsel on notice, and I think it gives. A defense counsel an argument of uh, an argument for sanctions if if the uh, plaintiff had uh, had in his possession evidence of ordinary course according to my reading of this opinion uh, plaintiff might might be sanctionable um, uh, for filing a frivolous case well this slide basically summarizes what I just said. Um, there's no abuse of discretion because uh, Zazov was relying on the minority approach of the second prong of the ordinary course. Now that there's no second prong, you know, again, I wonder what would have happened. And what's interesting to me is that the Seventh, the seventh Circuit specifically acknowledged the feeling of frustration of the bankruptcy judge. Uh, I think there's probably more frustration on the part of the defense counsel, but uh, if the bankruptcy judge uh, uh, agreed with significant sanctions, he must have been frustrated too. 
and and and, and this is I, I, the point I'm making here is that this is a very common frustration, especially among defense counsel, um, and um, and I think this opinion uh, in the seventh, seventh Circuit kind of op opens up, uh, especially in this jur in the jurisdiction of the Seventh Circuit. Uh, I think puts uh, plaintiff counsel on on, no on notice that the, that they have to take a look and see if there's a, an ordinary course defense. Um, so anyway, um, the, the court also dismissed the vexatious uh, litigation argument and obviously reversed the sanctions. This is my conclusion slide, which I've already pretty much covered. Uh, you got to make a reasonable inquiry. What that is, it's case to case. It's a case by case basis. But in the Seventh Circuit, I think the plaintiff counsel better look at the, the facts pretty carefully. This is a bankruptcy court level case in Georgia. Similar arguments, fairly similar fact pattern. And after the Seventh Circuit decision, Excello, this is in Georgia, uh, so it's not the Seventh Circuit. Um, but Court of Appeals case was recently decided on the issue, and it is cited uh, in this uh, in this opinion as well. So the facts unfolded pretty much as uh, they commonly do. Debtor leads building products, bought um, hardware supplies from defendant Moore Handley. Uh, leads goes bankrupt. Trustee is appointed. Sues. Uh, Hanley and a bunch of other vendors for preferences. Um, the defendant uh, made various arguments, ordinary course, subsequent new value, and won. Uh, but defendant's not happy with that. Also wants wants to get uh, defendants. Defendant wants to get it. I assume his attorney's fees paid and uh, doesn't feel that the action should have been brought at all. <laughs> you know, winning does that. Hey, if I won, <laughs> why should this have been brought to start with? Uh, anyway. Well, so it's the same thing. What kind of pre-filing inquiry burden does the plaintiff counsel have? Same statute. Well, what's a little bit of a, a little bit different here is that um, before the defendant was sued, um, the plaintiff had sent a demand letter, which is par for the course, very common. And in response to the demand letter, and this I don't I don't think I put this in the slides. In response to the demand letter, the defendant sent back a letter saying. Hey, we've got ordinary course arguments, and uh, this is uh, we got a complete defense based on ordinary course and new value, and uh, we're expecting you not to bring this action. So they wrote a letter, and uh, I guess nothing happened for a while, and they maybe thought it was resolved, and then they eventually get a complaint, and they have to deal with it and spend money and file a motion for summary judgment. So one of the arguments made by the by the defendant is that hey, they got they got the letter. They were on notice that there was an ordinary course defense here, um, and uh, uh, they should have done the proper inquiry. We told them there was an ordinary course defense and a subsequent new value defense. Uh, so you know they just brought the complaint. They want to churn legal fees. Uh, they want to force a quick settlement. This is a takedown. And uh, this is just just plain wrong. The debtor says, "Hey, we had, uh, yeah, we got the letter. So what? Uh, we had uh, uh, colorable arguments. Uh, everybody says it's uh, the defense. Everybody cites the ordinary course defense. Uh, why should we punish? Why should we be punished?" Um, Another fact that's important to this case is that when the defendant sent the letter and the court addressed this specifically in, in the opinion, the, um, the defendant did not send 
backup uh, spreadsheets and evidence. It made the argument in the letter, um, but it did not it, it did not provide uh, evidence in the form of uh, invoices and and specific arguments based on statistics that um, that this was an ordinary course defense. Well, the court distinguished Excello and and said and 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 read the opinion and said we're going to interpret that narrowly as uh, holding that there is no per se rule um, that uh, plaintiff counsel has to uh, examine uh, and do examine the affirmative defenses and do some kind of pre-filing uh, discovery and uh, unless the situation is very obvious um, the plaintiff has, has met his um, burden by doing a quick a cursory uh, uh, look and if and if the plaintiff thinks he has colorable arguments then he shouldn't be sanctioned and and the bankruptcy court here uh, thought that uh, that was the that was the case here. Uh, they got a letter and the bankruptcy court specifically said, hey, that's a very common defense. So everyone is saying they've got ordinary cars. So what? So what? The, the plaintiff counsel received a letter uh, saying that there's an ordinary course defense. Uh, that's not good enough. Uh, and, and, and the bankruptcy court noted in a footnote, even if the plaintiff counsel had gotten uh, evidence supporting an ordinary course defense, Unless it's an absolutely slam dunk ordinary course defense, the bankruptcy court in this case said uh, it still shouldn't uh, be sanctioned because uh, ordinary course defense can always argue it, not always, but many, many times you can argue it uh, from either side, uh, at least make a colorable argument. Um, and and so, um, so this wasn't, according to this bankruptcy court, a situation where um, uh, the plaintiff counsel has such, you know, had the evidence, he didn't have the evidence, he wasn't supplied the enough evidence, according to the bankruptcy judge, or at least he wasn't supplied obvious evidence or obvious analysis. And uh, even if he had been supplied with uh, uh, a clear evidence, um, it's not so clear whether he should be sanctioned. The bankruptcy court made a couple of other points in its ruling. One is Congress placed the burden of proof uh, in specific ways. It's the debtor's burden um, uh, to prove certain elements, and it's the defendant's burden uh, to prove affirmative defenses. And and the court specifically addressed it's not if I'm going to sanction the plaintiff, I'm, I'm, I'm switching the burden, uh, which is not what Congress, uh, in a way, switching the burden, which is not what Congress intended. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's not, again, it's not the debtor's job, uh, unless it's completely obvious, uh, whatever that means, um, to, uh, to do some kind of uh, uh, pre-filing, um, extensive pre-filing analysis, um, especially uh, in a situation like ordinary course, where you you can argue uh, you can argue both sides. I think it's important in this case. The specific facts are important because. Had the defendant provided a complete analysis and had the defendant spoon fed plaintiff counsel uh, prior to filing a complaint, not that clear that the result would be the same, depending on the strength of the case. If, 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 the, if the analysis and the evidence uh, made it so obvious that there's an ordinary course of it, and there, and there really isn't any, um, non-frivolous counter to that, then it's possible, I think, even given this 
uh, the holding of this case. As, well, I don't think it's it's certainly possible that the plaintiff counsel might have been sanctioned. And also in this case, uh, one of the facts uh, cited in the opinion is that uh, once the complaint was brought and a motion for summary judgment was filed, plaintiff counsel did not oppose it, didn't oppose with a with a cross motion or an objection to the motion. Uh, they folded. Uh, they conceded. <laughs> they conceded all the, the, all the entire case. And so it leads me to think that this defense must have been very, very, very strong. And uh, it leads me to think that if defendant, count, defendant counsel had, had uh, instead of just written a letter, had uh, hit the plaintiff counsel on top of the head with a brief or something uh, prior to the case, uh, it may, eh, maybe the plaintiff counsel wouldn't have even brought, uh, filed a complaint. Who knows? Uh, but I, I think the lesson here is you better spoon feed uh, plaintiff counsel if you're expecting a complaint not to be brought, or if you're if you want to be able to uh, to sue for sanctions um, later. Also, the the court addressed the issue of uh, the argument by the defendant. Hey, you know these guys just brought this to extract a settlement, and the court the court looked at that. And said, well, that's not specifically addressed in 9011. However, uh, if I made a determination, a fact determination, that that was the only reason a case was brought specifically to extract sanctions, I mean to extract uh, uh, settlement money, then maybe that would be sanctionable. It's basically dicta. But um, you know, the court found uh, you didn't see that situation here. Um, so I, I, offhand, I think it would be extremely hard to prove uh, in a, a situation like that. Well, I, I think the takeaway here in, is fairly narrow. I would take away that in, it, it, in this particular bankruptcy court in Georgia, that um, you're not going to get sanctions unless um, uh, unless you provide unless you have a, an absolutely slam dunk case and you present all the evidence and spreadsheets and arguments to the plaintiff, um, then maybe, maybe you'd have a shot at, at sanctions. Um, but I, I would interpret that narrowly. I think it's a very, I think this court interpreted Excello very narrowly. And uh, I, I don't know if other courts are really going to follow um, such a narrow interpretation. This is another sanctions case, Eastern District of New York and Long Island, Burger Industries versus Art Mark, 2003. The debtor was in the manufacturing business. Art Mark was the supplier of uh, industrial components, uh, usual scenario, bankruptcy, and a vendor is sued for preference, this time uh, 177K and change. What was unusual about this case is that it lasted six years. Uh, I can't even imagine how a fairly, well, I would say a mid-sized preference case could last six years, but apparently uh, the lawyers clashed and the defendants, defendant and plaintiff clashed a lot. And there was a lot of dis discovery disputes and motion practice. At the end of the day, uh, defendant won at trial. The defendant asserted ordinary course and, and uh, due value. And uh, what's interesting here is that um, the debtor's counsel eventually and incrementally reduced the claim based on the new value defense and eventually reduced the claim to 55K, I believe, right before trial. Um, court finally dismissed the case. The case is closed. And then, of course, you have a classic fact pattern, uh, defendant wins and is now even more irritated and four months later uh, files a, uh, a, a motion for sanctions. By the way, against debtors counsel Angel, Angel and Frankel. By the way, I'm personally uh, familiar with Angel and Frankel. I, I, I think the firm has been disbanded, but a very, very respected uh, boutique uh, bankruptcy uh, law firm. 
as in the other case, the, the basic question is, what kind of inquiry does, does the plaintiff counsel have to make before filing a, a preference clawback? Does he have to does he have to look at evidence? Does he have to look at the strength of affirmative defenses, or is this really uh, you know none of his business? It's the same statute. Also, 927, uh, since there was a, uh, an allegation under this statute that uh, uh, debtors' counsel, uh, actually in this case, debtors' counsel accused uh, defense counsel of acting unreasonably and vexatiously. Well, the position of the defendant is the typical outrage. Uh, you knew this was ordinary course. We eventually won on ordinary course. And you had all the data, you could have simply, you know, you had, you should have taken a look at it and you, and you should, ha there should be a rule uh, or we're arguing or, or we are arguing that there is a rule, rule 9011 that requires you to investigate uh, before you file a case like this. And again, it's, a, it's the same sense of outrage. Um, and I, I, I think it's caused by, you know, this kind of the strange I think strange division of burden of proof, but at any rate, uh, should the plaintiff have taken a look at the affirmative defenses? Um, and uh, in this case, it ended up, it ended up uh, what was contested was about 55K and the defendant spent, you know, over 99K in legal fees. So obviously these are not happy people, happy with the result, even though they won. It's a Pyrrhic victory. But the defendant went beyond a mere 9-11 uh, sanctions request. The defendant basically says <laughs> that the plaintiff and the plaintiff's lawyer should go to jail. Uh, they, should be, they should be jailed uh, because they both committed, uh, one committed perjury and the lawyer uh, was uh, part of that, part of a conspiracy to commit perjury. And so, uh, uh, yes, they went there. They went to the higher level. Um, and then the debtor outraged, now outright, now the debtor counsel is outraged, makes a cross mo motion for sanctions, um, asking the judge to punish defendant and defendant's counsel uh, for making such uh, an outrageous uh, allegation. And defendant's, uh, I'm sorry, debtor's counsel uh, wanted uh, financial sanctions, uh, but also wanted a written retraction acceptable to the debtor and uh, and the attorney for the debtor um, to be submitted to the court, acceptable to the court and to the debtor and debtor's counsel. Defendant then sought additional sanctions, saying that the debtor was being vexatious. Uh, I think... Uh, this was definitely a very vexatious uh, situation. Well, the court found that, and it was kind of an interesting opinion in, in this respect. Uh, the court, the court said to the defendant, hey, "You didn't really, you didn't provide any proof um, that the plaintiff counsel did not, or a plaintiff did not perform an inquiry," and w which leads you to wonder what kind of proof would there be? Uh, should the defendant had a uh, deposed uh, the debtor on on the issue of what kind of uh, evidence they looked at, what kind of preparation they made. I, I don't know, but the court is saying the court ruled, hey, you know, there's no evidence in front of me that the debtor did not perform an inquiry. The defendant saying, well, it's obvious they didn't because they filed a complaint, and the court saying, well, that's that's not good enough. Also, the court saying that, um, you know, the, the the, the, the plaintiff doesn't have the burden in this, given this fact pattern of investigating affirmative defenses to the degree in this fact pattern that uh, the defendant uh, uh, wants these uh, defenses uh, to be investigated. Um, and the, and the, court, the court focused, um, uh, uh, like the Court of Appeals Court, uh, on the, on the, fact that at this time the plaintiff uh, uh, or rather the defendant 
had uh, two prongs to prove under the ordinary course defense, both uh, ordinary course between the parties and the industry standard. And the court is saying, uh, there's just no way uh, that we're going to require the plaintiff to somehow figure out what the industry standard is or is not. It's not going to have that kind of evidence. And so uh, the court specifically noted that. And so one wonders uh, now that the industry standard uh, uh, prong is not required, uh, whether these courts might have divide, might have uh, uh, seen this uh, differently, might have ruled differently. Uh, and, and again, the, the stress is on, we're, we're not going to require, you know, it, it, if it's completely obvious, okay, uh, then the plaintiff shouldn't bring the case if, if, if the defenses are obvious. But here, uh, they're not obvious. How do you, what's the plaintiff know about industry standard? And we're not going to require that the, that the, that the plaintiff somehow engage in pre-filing discovery. That's, that's not the way the rules are structured. Um, and that would be required if the plaintiff had to determine whether the defendant had an industry standard defense. And so it's, we're just not going to, we're not going to agree that this conduct is sanctionable. In addition, the court agreed uh, uh, with respect to the perjury accusation. In that situation, the, the um, a plaintiff had uh, submitted for settlement purposes an affidavit to the defendant to rebut the defendant's ordinary course argument. And the, um, you know, the affidavit uh, was from an officer uh, at the debtor saying that uh, there was a, there was a, uh, a rise in collection activity or something of that nature. And the defendant um, said that this was a false affidavit. He knew it was false, it was perjury. And the defendant pointed to the, to the fact that later the judge found that this defendant was not credible. And the court said, hey, this doesn't rise to the level of perjury. Yeah, maybe it's not credible or not consistent, uh, but that, that's not a, that doesn't mean there's an intentional willful lying taking place um, or a subordination of perjury. And, um, and uh, to the contrary, the court found that, uh, that the witness seemed to be acting in good faith. And also the court noted that uh, the, court, the court thought that the, that the defendant's witness it was also not credible uh, and pointed that out in the decision. Uh, so there's no perjury and uh, the, the court uh, the, and the court rejected the debtor's request for sanctions uh, and a written retraction because that would invite even more litigation. We're now at eight, the court noted we're now at eight at the eight year mark at this point of the court's ruling. And uh, the court denied uh, the defendant's motion for sanctions for the reasons we discussed and uh, de denied everything and basically said, go home and case closed. You can kind of sense the judge's exasperation at, at this point uh, with, I think with both these, with both these parties. I, I think the main, the main thing that I take away from this is that uh, you got to have some kind of, first of all, there's got to be some kind of obvious defense and there's got to be some kind of evidence, evidence that the, again, that the plaintiff counsel was spoon fed uh, with this information and, and, and evidence. Um, uh, otherwise you're really not going to have a shot at sanctions on the ordinary course defense. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not impossible. It may be if it's a very obvious subsequent new value defense and you provide spreadsheets and evidence, uh, you don't give, uh, a counsel, uh, you don't give plaintiff counsel uh, any wiggle room there. You might have a shot at it. Okay, this is another situation where we have an outraged defendant and a, uh, a plaintiff uh, counsel who claims just to be doing his job. 2005 in from Kentucky. Well, in this case, a uh, typical fact scenario, the trustee filed a, a lot of, in this case, 69 preference actions. Um, and uh, in this case, there's a little bit of a wrinkle. Trustee, uh, the defendant, you know, the complaint was filed, but it wasn't served. 
Um, trustees counsel didn't serve the complaint yet, but an answer was filed. And then defendant provided um, uh, information to the uh, trustee and lo and behold, trustee dismissed, uh, withdrew the complaint. Um, uh, and then of course, that wasn't good enough for the defendant and filed the motion for sanctions. About two months after the, the complaint was dismissed. Now, same issue, whether uh, 9011 was violated. Uh, and here, there's a, a stress we haven't seen before, um, supported by case law in the Sixth Circuit, but it's in the statute. Um, whether the defendant complied with the, complied with the 21 day safe harbor provision in 9011C1A. This we've seen before. What this section says is that you could serve the motion, but you can't file the motion uh, until after 21 days because you basically basically the statute is giving is giving the uh, the recipient of the motion a, a chance to uh, to mend his or her ways and uh, and correct whatever is alleged to be in violation of uh, 9011. Well, similar arguments are made. Defendant says uh, there was, was a total lack of inquiry and it's frivolous, turning legal fees, blah, blah, blah. The trustee argues that the defendant's motion is frivolous. And also on top of that, uh, we did what we could as far as pre-suit investigations, and uh, it's in violation of the safe harbor section of 9011. Well, the court went into some case law in the Sixth Circuit uh, to, and said to start with, um, this, this motion did not satisfy the 21-day safe harbor rule. Uh, the complaint had already been dismissed and uh, between the lines, I, I think the court is saying, Hey, you know, they just, you know, the, the fact pattern is not great here for sanctions. Yes, it was filed, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't even served. So the, the case hadn't even really started yet. And, and somehow the defendant is, is putting in uh, defendant counsel is putting in tons of time and then wants sanctions. It's just, not a very sympathetic case, I think, to start with. And it violated the 20-day safe harbor rule. Uh, the defendant didn't give the, the plaintiff a chance to correct. And because the plaintiff already corrected, he, just, he, he withdrew the complaint, made a motion to withdraw the complaint. So it's not a very sympathetic case, uh, in my opinion. Um, and then it went into the standard uh, and what burden is, is, uh, is placed on uh, an attorney's conduct uh, before filing a complaint under the Sixth Circuit. And it went into some factors and found that here, trustee's attorney was operating in a restricted time frame. It had a limited amount of time. It had to meet a deadline, uh, statute of limitations, two year statute of limitations. So they were rushing, they had a lot of cases. Uh, uh, and the judge gave him a lot of a lot of we a lot of leeway, basically saying, you know, he, this this attorney would not did not do better or worse than anybody else, any other attorney uh, in the same situation. So, the judge had a lot of sympathy, and I, I think it's because of the, the fact pattern. I mean, they did dismiss, uh, move to move to withdraw the the complaint upon upon giving some uh, giving some evidence. Uh, what's interesting here is that the, the court uh, uh, broke down some factors to look at uh, in this kind of situation where we're analyzing whether attorneys should be um, a sanctioned in a pre-lawsuit situation. So we're going to look at the time available to the signer uh, for investigation, whether the signer had to rely on, the, on a client for information as to the facts underlying, underlying the pleading motion or paper, 
maybe they didn't get the information from the client. I think that seems to imply um, uh, whether it was plausible based on a plausible view of the law, uh, whatever that means. Um, and based on all these factors, the court denied the, the motion for sanctions. Like I say, not a very sympathetic uh, a fact pattern for the uh, movement. Yet another case where we have an outraged defendant and uh, this time the uh, defendant got a little bit of love from the judge. This is Bankruptcy Court, Delaware, 2009, fairly recent. Well, what happened here is that the, the plaintiff representing a debtor, NEGT Energy Trading Holdings, ET Holdings, sued a law firm uh, to recover transfers made in the 90-day period, a fairly substantial number. The problem is, uh, or the problem developed, I should say that Oric had not actually been paid by ET. Oric had been paid by a looks like an agent, it's a complicated fact pattern, it looks like an agent of the parent company. So the parent company is P, G, and E. Oric was paid by an entity called Power Service uh, Services Company, which, is, which was a non-debtor subsidiary of NEGT, owned by P, G, and E. So it wasn't paid by uh, ET Holdings. That's, that's the first issue. Uh, so that's obviously going to be a challenge for the uh, plaintiff to overcome. Oric had submitted uh, invoices to PG&E. PG&E forwarded those invoices to ET Holdings. ET Holdings approved them, but it was Power Services that actually paid the money. It later sought reimbursement of the funds from the debtor. Oric moved for summary judgment. The court doesn't go into the details of why summary judgment was granted, but it was granted. One can surmise that the argument was that the payment was not property of the estate, wasn't pro property of ET Holdings. And that's my guess, but the court didn't go into the exact facts. After that, Oric filed the motion for sanctions against the debtor and its lawyers. Since the court had already granted summary judgment, um, obviously the only issue is uh, the conduct of the, of the plaintiff and plaintiff's counsel. Uh, was this a violation of 9011? Same statute. Well, the court, in its opinion, uh, decided to sanction uh, the plaintiff. And, and, and the reasons, the basic reason is that uh, they didn't have a case. The plaintiff didn't have a case. And according to the court, uh, you know, started making up uh, facts. And even if the facts were true, uh, they wouldn't have a case under existing law. Uh, what the court seemed to be saying is that um, there's no basis for saying or for alleging or for representing that um, there was a loan made from uh, from power from power to the uh, to the debtor. No basis, no evidence for that. Even if there had been a loan, even if the payment by Power Services to Oric um, had been some kind of a loan to um, uh, the debtor, even if that were the case, the debtor would never have had control over those funds and there would be, a uh, court seemed to imply, a, uh, a slam dunk earmarking defense uh, that would be available to Oric. And even if that were the case, um, uh, the case would be uh, completely meritless. Plaintiff, of course, argued that uh, that um, it acted properly and uh, should not be sanctioned. 
one of the w one of the concepts that the court focused on is that um, uh, payments made to the law firm by PowerWave uh, would have not, would have had would not have diminished um, the estate of the debtor, uh, and the, and 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 the debtor listed several bank accounts and and showed that where the, where these funds originated and, and were paid to Oric, uh, the debtor did not have a, any control over that bank account. And basically, the the, the opinion, the, the entire opinion seems to summarize the judge's um, theory that uh, the plaintiff just just didn't have a case and just was grasping at some kind of theory and it was it was just too thin just too thin not based on on real facts and even if the facts again were true there wouldn't be much there wouldn't be much of a case anyway What irritated the court even more is that uh, the plaintiff cited cases that were easily distinguishable um, and, and and just not just not relevant. Um, also, the, the law firm uh, uh, allegedly uh, submitted false statements of facts and uh, failed to amend their original complaint uh, to reflect the uh, the new theories the court declined to at at the end of the opinion the the the, uh, the, the court stated that it would decline to hold an evidentiary hearing on uh on how much is, it was going to sanction it. it would just make a decision uh you, you could sense the irritation in the opinion it just wanted to close this case out and i guess i guess it came up with a number This case is a higher level ruling by a Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals level on whether a trustee should have been sanctioned or not. So the debtor was in the business of manufacturing t-shirts. Uh, business started going south because competition arose overseas. The costs were much uh, less overseas to manufacture t-shirts and so company could not be competitive and so the debtor made some changes and essentially sold um, or transferred inventory to an offshore affiliate uh, also inventory was purchased by the owners of uh, owners and managers of the debtor uh, in an attempt to uh, save this company and give it some cash flow. Unfortunately, though, the trustees saw this as uh, some kind of sinister fraudulent conveyance um, by the management, uh, presumably um, some kind of uh, unfair, uh, lower than market price for inventory, and then transferring inventory to offshore companies and you know when you look at it without investigating the evidence uh, you know it does raise suspicion uh, that the company goes bankrupt right after all these transfers anyway trustee brought the fraudulent conveyance action probably did not have all the information necessary to evaluate it at the time he brought it uh, which is often the case and in the end uh, evidence was provided there was a trial <coughs> and the defendants succeeded in showing first of all that the inventory they bought was actually lower than market price and that everything was in good faith it was just an attempt to to be more competitive and to transfer inventory offshore so the t-shirts could be made at a lower price uh, it looked suspicious but turned out it was, uh, it was, it was uh, completely done. Uh, all, all, everything was done in good faith. In an attempt to save the company, bankruptcy court, bankruptcy judge heard a lot of testimony and uh, made his ruling that uh, essentially dismissing these actions. Um, Apparently, this bankruptcy judge was not happy uh, with the trustee's conduct and 
decided to you know it's always it's always with the party that loses the case that's open to these to these sanctions for being frivolous uh, never the party that wins obviously history is written by the winners so trusty you know basically fell flat on his face in this case and uh bankruptcy court uh sympathetic to the cost of the defendant and all the hassle they had to go through uh, i assume I'm reading it into I'm reading that into the facts, but I don't think that's a stretch. Uh, probably sanction the trustee uh, on a couple of grounds. He sanctioned the trustee on two on two grounds. First, that the trustee brought an action against a company called Old Fort, which is I guess one of the affiliates, and later found out that uh, there weren't any transfers. To old Fort, but the trustee didn't dismiss the claim. Uh, the trustee didn't pursue the claim. He didn't dismiss it though, so he didn't bring it to trial, didn't do discovery, and just and conceded uh, at some point in a transcript saying, "Hey, I guess there were no transfers to Old Fort, but we, we'd like an accounting." Um, but he didn't formally withdraw the claim, so the bankruptcy court uh, sanctioned him for that. Um, Additionally, the uh, bankruptcy court sanctioned the trustee for maintaining, I think I have some slides on this, but I'll just tell you now, sanctioned the trustee for bringing constructive fraudulent conveyance claims and preference claims when supposedly he should have known uh, that there was uh, evidence that the company was solvent uh, during that period. So, so in other words, he was missing a major element of his case, but didn't withdraw those either. So judge sanctioned, sanctioned him for that too. So were these, uh, you know, the trustee appealed to the district court, district court ap approved the bankruptcy court decision, trustee further appeared, appealed to the court of appeals for the fourth circuit. This is the statute that we've seen a number of times already and is this uh is this applicable does the did the bankruptcy judge uh, have support in the statute for sanctioning on the two grounds uh, that uh, it uh, identified well the trustees argument uh actually the entire case was appealed and the not only the sanctions, but the entire case. And uh, the trustee made his arguments uh, again and said he had good reason to believe that, uh, that th these uh, transfers should be avoided. Bankruptcy court held there's no error and affirmed the trial court's bankruptcy court's decision on the fraudulent conveyance counts. Uh, I have noted that the court had uh, had reviewed uh, had, uh, reviewed uh, extensive testimony. Now the question is, uh, did the bankruptcy court uh, abuse its discretion in sanctioning the trustee? And the court ruled that. Uh, Sanction uh, was sanctions were not appropriate uh, in in two ways. First, um, you don't need to withdraw if you if you file a lawsuit in good faith. It was not initially frivolous. Uh, you don't have to withdraw it later. Uh, there's no requirement. The court found that there was no requirement uh, in the statute uh, requiring the withdrawal of claims. So that's number one, that's shot down. Uh, and it goes into some analysis here. The second basis that the court had for sanctioning a trustee was that the trustee should have known that the company was solvent because of testimony by an expert. It turns out that was just a mistake. Uh, Fourth Circuit looked at the transcript, looked at the testimony, and the expert didn't testify as to that. It turned out it was just clear error. 
that there was no evidence supplied by the expert and that the trustee never conceded that the the debtor was solvent at that time which is after june 30th 1998 so it was just reversible error it was just a mistake and so the sanctions um were reversed on that count as well so what's the takeaway here the takeaway here is if you're going to try to sue a trustee and get sanctions or ask for sanctions not sue a trustee but ask for a sanction if you're able to uh, successfully win or defend your fraudulent conveyance case it's not going to work unless you can show that it was initially frivolous uh, just because he failed to withdraw, at least in the Fourth Circuit, it's not going to be enough. Um, you know, the the fact that there was error, there's really, there's there's really, uh, I guess the takeaway is, you know, review review the uh, if you're going to ask for sanctions here, I think it was sua sponte anyway. I don't think the sanctions were asked for, um, but um, you know, look at the record, make sure you're right. It involves the redemption of notes from note holders and a trustee suing and claiming that these redemptions and related contracts and agreements uh, constituted fraudulent conveyances. The court went into the facts in a lot of details and, and basically the note holders sought to dismiss the case. They also sought sanctions um, under 9011. And they also asserted that these were protected payments under 546 as uh, settlement payments. Rule nine again. It's a constructive fraudulent conveyance case. The defendants asserted that Rule 9B applies. The defendants argued that sanctions are appropriate here uh, since they requested that the trustee voluntarily dismiss the case after pointing out what they felt were deficiencies in the complaint and the trustee refused. So that's the issue. Well, there were, tough, there were a couple of different arguments. That basically, the note holders were arguing that this is some kind of a disguised preference case, that there is an antecedent debt. Uh, it was payment of a note, um, number one. And so the whole thing is completely wrong. And then number two, under 546E, they shouldn't be sued because of the settlement payments, so they're protected. And the complaint is uh, uh, insufficient on its face at any rate. Trustee argued that this, these are fraudulent conveyances. Uh, the debtor was insolvent and he stuck to his guns. Not going to go into the complexities, but basically the court ruled that the trustee just parroted the law, fraudulent, especially state law, state fraudulent conveyance law, and wasn't sufficient, didn't say exactly um, how this law applied. Well, some of the counts weren't dismissed, though. The court, with respect to the 546 argument and the argument that these were antecedent debts, basically the court said, I'm required to accept the allegations as true in the complaint, and maybe the trustee can prove it. Uh, but the, trust, the court noted that it, that it believed it was remote um, and that these defenses uh, were inappropriately asserted in a motion to dismiss and can be asserted in summary judgment or a trial but it's not a motion it's not a sufficiency of the pleading issue he's alleging that uh, there was not an antecedent debt and that's his allegation it has to be dealt with it's a fact issue As far as sanctions, the court found, especially since the court didn't dismiss all accounts, um, 
didn't find that the that the trustee's claims were frivolous, legally unreasonable, without factual foundation. At least he didn't find it yet. <laughs> One wonders if that finding is going to be made later in the case, but didn't find it at this stage and uh, uh, refused to impose sanctions uh, uh, because sa such sanctions should only be imposed under very limited circumstances. Otherwise, you discourage people from using the court system. I happen to think maybe that's a good idea. And it spawns uh, satellite litigation counterproductive to efficient disposition of cases. It's very hard, to, very hard to sanction a trustee. Very hard. In fact, I've seldom, almost never, have seen a trustee sanctioned. In fact, I don't think I ever have seen a trustee sanctioned. I'm sure they have been sanctioned in my lifetime for bringing preferences in fraudulent conveyance cases, but not in any of my cases. And I don't remember reading a situation where a trustee uh, was sanctioned. Okay, so bankruptcy court level case for sanctions, uh, again against a, uh, a trustee and trustee's counsel. 2011, Delaware, again, uh, bankruptcy court level. So uh, this is just a you know uh, a uh, a standard kind of preference case uh, uh, brought against a uh, a vendor and uh, and the complaint was pretty much boilerplate. The allegation there was a motion to dismiss by the by the defendant and basically the allegation is. Uh, it didn't. The, the complaint basically just set out allegations pursuant to uh, the statute. Just repeated the statute. Basically, it didn't supply uh, uh, sufficient facts. Didn't say why there was an antecedent debt. Didn't describe the services that were provided. Uh, didn't even identify whether there was more, <laughs> whether there was a single defendant or more defendants. It had a defendant open parenthesis S close parenthesis in the complaint. Um, it didn't, uh, uh, didn't describe the nature of the relationship. It basically didn't go into that pretty much any facts at all. Um, very boilerplate. So should the complaint be dismissed with prejudice, which is, of course, what the defendant wants, and should uh, should the trust, trustee be required and his counsel be required to uh, pay, uh, or in this case, I guess the debtor be required to pay uh, sanctions, attorney's fees? That's the statute. Well, I already said what the what the uh, defendant is is alleging and basically the defendant saying doesn't it doesn't meet the Supreme Court uh, requirement of plausibility. Also, there was a fraudulent conveyance count. There's no factual basis for that either. There was no there was an allegation that there was insufficient value or no value, but no facts. What was not supplied? What was supposed to be supplied? Um, Absolutely no background facts at all. The defendant also pointed out that uh, it's not a situation, and this is where the fact that it's the debtor doing the suing is important. It's not, you know, there's a bunch of files transferred to a trustee, and then um, uh, the trustee doesn't have time or doesn't have the right files or doesn't know what's going on and is meeting a deadline, has got to file a boilerplate complaint or be foreclosed by a statute of limitations. But that's not what happened here. Uh, you know, the, the defendant pointed out, hey, this is the debtor. They have all the information, or they should have all the information uh, in, uh, to, to fill out the complaint a little bit. But they, they didn't bother, according to the defendant, and they just uh, supplied these threadbare allegations. There's sort of a Dickinsonian uh, sound to that. So uh, the judge agreed, and uh, the plaintiff found a, uh, 
I'm sorry, the defendant found a sympathetic ear and the judge didn't, but the judge denied the motions to dismiss with the motion to dismiss with prejudice and told the plaintiff to, uh, you know, just fix your, <laughs> fix your complaint and refile it. But the court did award attorney's fees, um, uh, uh, for the work required to uh, file a motion to dismiss and for sanctions. So I don't know what this is. It's a wrap on the knuckles and, uh, you know, it's a little, a little indication to, uh, plaintiffs, uh, counsel and trustee, uh, well, not trustees, debtors, I guess, I guess it's really just a plaintiff counsel. Just be more careful next time, put in some facts. Uh, what was accomplished here by this defendant counsel? I don't, I'm not really sure. Not a lot. This is a court of appeals case involving sanctions against the trustee um, uh, in a ruling issued by the bankruptcy court. Trustee was sanctioned, appealed to the district court, and then to the court of appeals by the trustee. Fairly complicated fact pattern. Flashcom was an internet service provider. The defendant was apparently one of the founders of the company. Uh, there was a venture capital arrangement and other directors that we don't need to go into. But basically, uh, there was a payment at some point to Andrea, one of the founders of $9 million, essentially in settlement of various disputes um, between the venture firm and, and Andrea. Apparently the venture firm wanted Andrea out. Andrea was pivotal in obtaining new financing and the end result was a wire to her of $9 million. Unfortunately, the market, there was big success in obtaining financing and this was 1999. And then as, as some people remember, there was stock market crash and, uh, and then the, uh, the market kind of dried up for financing and the company, uh, filed for, uh, chapter 11. Anyway, this was actually before 2001 and that recession, but it was a result of the stock market crash that happened, uh, I believe in 1999, maybe it was 2000. At any rate, trustee enters into an agreement with uh, Andrea, enters into a number of agreements, but the relevant one here is enters into an agreement with Andrea um, with respect to the trustee's allegation that the that the $9 million was either a fraudulent conveyance and or a preferential payment. And uh, there's also settlement with other folks. There's a global settlement agreement, which is approved by the court. After the agreement, the trustee then uh, moves for partial summary judgment. And this is where the trouble begins. Um, I, I read the bankruptcy court opinion, the district court opinion, the court of appeals court opinion. I still don't understand exactly what happened, but it looks like there was a misunderstanding uh, with respect to the settlement agree agreement and certainly the, at least the, uh, the defendant's relevant to this action obviously did not expect to be to be uh to have a default judgment entered for nine million uh the agreement was to settle this action in for under two million actually the agreement was in was like fifty thousand to settle the action up to two million based on various factors but all of a sudden they enter the agreement a couple of days later the trustee moves for a partial summary judgment for nine million and I'm not going to go into the, uh, uh, the merits of the trustees interpretation of the settlement agreement, but
but apparently it was unexpected, both by the judge and by the and by the the other parties. At any rate, uh, the motion for partial summary judgment was denied. Bankruptcy court denies it and says that the defendants have a Fifth Amendment due process right to defend the claims against this against them uh, before they can be deprived of their property under the clawback laws. Trustee is not happy with this. She moves for a reconsideration of the bankruptcy court's order that's duly considered and quickly denied. Trustee seeks leave to appeal. That's also denied. Then the trustee moves for reconsideration of the court's denial of leave to prosecute the interlocutory appeal. That's duly considered denied. Obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but I don't think the judge is, is going to be very happy with this with this trustee. Prior to prior, obviously, there's there's something some <laughs> unhappiness here, both on the part of the trustee and I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that the court's not happy either. So the last straw trustee files a motion in limine to preclude the defendants from introducing evidence concerning the avoidability of the $9 million transfer prior to the trial on these issues. And the defendants file, and, 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 and in the opinion, the, trust, the, the transcript shows that the court specifically warned the trustee about uh, this motion uh, that it, that uh, could be uh, could be sanctionable. That the trustee plows ahead, and the defendants uh, uh, later file a motion for sanctions, and uh, suffice it to say that the trustee lost uh, the trial, and the defendants prevailed on uh, on defending both the fraudulent conveyance and a preference, or we probably wouldn't be talking about a motion for sanctions. Maybe we, maybe we would be in this case, but as as uh, in most cases, in fact, in every case that I've read where a motion for sanctions is granted, that party lost on a substantive level. At any rate, uh, the bankruptcy judge grants the motion for sanctions. And uh, the, the basis of the ruling is, hey, uh, this is, a, I've already seen this issue. I've already decided this issue. I've already reconsidered this issue uh, four times. And now you're going to ask without any new arguments or new facts, you're going to try to, uh, again, relitigate the same issue by filing a motion in limine, again, trying to prevent the defendant's uh, from uh, defending themselves in, in this action. Bankruptcy Court granted um, uh, uh, granted the uh, the sanctions, was appealed to the District Court, and then appealed to the Court of Appeals by the trust. There's the statute. Well, the Ninth Circuit upheld the bankruptcy court uh, decision, upheld the decision both as to the substantive fraudulent conveyance and preference issues, um, but also the court's decision on, on sanctions. I'm not going to go into the substance. It's not really relevant for this slideshow, uh, but this is relevant. Um, uh, essentially, uh, Court of Appeals agreed that the motion was frivolous. The trustee didn't cite a change in the law, new facts. Uh, the trustee um, knew or maybe should have known that this was going to cause damage to the defendants and cause yet more money 
to defend themselves. That's not an abuse of discretion. In this situation, uh, trustee had already been shot down many times. And unless there was a reason to try again, and there wasn't, uh, as found by the Ninth Circuit, uh, there was an intent to uh, injure the defendants with, with further costs and fees that they'd have to pay to their counsel. And uh, uh, the bankruptcy court did not abuse its discretion by sanctioning um, uh, the trustee and her counsel. And it was a pretty big number, 60K. It wasn't the 97K that the court acknowledged the defendants had reasonably spent on, on, on this matter, responding to the motion in limine and bringing sanctions, motions, etc. However, the court noted that the purpose of 9011 is to deter, is to deter bad conduct and apparently 60k was not abuse of discretion that's enough to make this trustee think twice uh, the next time uh, um, issues are ruled upon and and she wants to try again this is a very recent uh, bankruptcy court level case again uh, a trustee or, or rather, in this case, an attorney for a debtor uh, acting uh, frivolously. Well, so Heritage was a company that uh, was in the business of buying real estate, renovating it, reselling it, and uh, took out a mortgage for that purpose. The mortgage was eventually transferred to uh, a bank called First Citizens Bank, FCB. Initially, it borrowed from another bank, and then it was transferred to uh, FCB. That's really that's really all you need to know here. Uh, there was uh, the bank had a security interest, obviously, in in uh, real estate in uh, Staten Island. Heritage defaulted. And uh, negotiations commenced with the bank. The bank said, just give us the property, deed in lieu of foreclosure. Heritage said, no, 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 I'm going to sell the property and, uh, and then I'll pay you the proceeds. So that's what happened. So they sold the property, um, uh, paid the bank, and uh, the lawyer for Heritage decided to uh, uh, there was a bankruptcy filing, obviously, and then the lawyer for Heritage decided uh, to sue the bank, FCB. Uh, the lawyer decided to sue the bank for a preference and for fraudulent conveyance. Well, I have to actually take that back. It wasn't, the bank wasn't actually sued because the complaint was never served. So it was filed. I don't know how FCB even knew about it. I guess they did an online search. Said, hey, we're being sued. Not good. So they filed a motion to dismiss the complaint, even though they hadn't been served yet. Seems kind of premature. Uh, and then uh, in, that, in that motion, uh, there was also a demand uh, under 9011 saying, hey, you know, dismiss it. Uh, this is you're on notice that uh, this is frivolous and uh, you're going to be we're going to hit you with sanctions unless you dismiss it and the plaintiff uh, who never served the plaintiff or counsel never served the complaint but then a month later dismissed it you'll note that's more than 21 days there's a reason i put that in there and you'll see anyway um fcb was not happy with that and moved to vacate uh, the dismissal, sort of a, how dare you sue us kind of a move and contended that the dismissal, dismissal should be with prejudice. FCB also uh, later sued for sanctions under 9011 saying, hey, this whole thing was totally frivolous, totally frivolous. This thing never should have been filed. And uh, 
and that's and and the judge has to decide are they right uh, should the bank get sanctions after all the thing was never served the complaint was never served there's a statute so how bad was this how bad was this complaint uh, FCB argued that uh, uh, that there was absolutely no basis to this thing, and hey, we gave her we gave her a shot to uh, to withdraw the uh, complaint. She had the 21 day safe harbor provided in in the statute, and uh, she didn't comply. She didn't she didn't withdraw the complaint uh, prior to the expiration of the safe harbor period in 9011C. Therefore, uh, she's got to be uh, she's got to be sanctioned. Of course, counsel for the debtor say, "Hey, I didn't even I didn't even serve it. I didn't even serve the complaint. It was you know it was filed in good faith, and uh, I didn't even bother serving it. I told them I wasn't. In fact, she says I told them I wasn't going to serve it. Well, the court took a look at the at the complaint." And just you know basically tore it apart there's just nothing here it's not a fraudulent conveyance uh, because uh, the bank wasn't even a transferee of the real estate it was sold by a third party and then the bank was paid what it was owed where's where's the fraudulent conveyance there's just not there there's just no facts at all to support that uh, not a not a preferential payment because it's a secured creditor would have been paid in full anyway there's just no basis there nothing so you know the court's looking at this and not happy so the court's basically saying you know this is clearly sanctionable there's no basis for any of this stuff And the court said, hey, you know, I've got to do something here. You know, I don't, you, you know, I've got to deter you from filing complaints that have zero basis. This is not how we do business here in this bankruptcy court. Uh, and the question is, you know, well, how much, how much am I going to sanction? Well, the court said, okay, um, you missed the you missed the you know it was voluntary voluntarily dismissed i am going to you know acknowledge that it wasn't prosecuted it, on the other hand it wasn't timely withdrawn um and, and so the court split the baby ba ba split the baby basically saying i'm not going to grant all the cost of the motion to dismiss because you would have had that cost anyway uh, even if uh, the lawyer for the debtor had fully complied with the 21 day window provided by 9011 but you know I'm, I'm gonna grant I'm gonna grant some of the uh, attorneys fees that you asked for so basically the court's ruling was um, you spent some time filing the motion to dismiss, and the complaint clearly violated 9011B. On the other hand, it was never served, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to award some money as a deterrence uh, uh, to uh, debtor's counsel. Well, <laughs> I, I think the, I think the, the takeaway here is don't file things that are just totally not based in any kind of uh, in any kind of facts that's going to support a fraudulent conveyance or a preference case. Read some books. This is a bankruptcy court level case, also very recent, 2017, involving a trucking company. Well, the trucking company goes bankrupt. Prior to the bankruptcy, the president of the company uh, loaned money to the to the company, and 
unfortunately was repaid at least part of that during the preference period. So he sued for a preference and uh, trustee grants uh, a partial defense, uh, but continues uh, pursuing uh, some of these transfers as uh, preferential. Well, this is essentially a discovery dispute. Uh, the plaintiff, the plaintiff trustee, uh, essentially is saying that uh, served the discovery demands, and uh, the defendant's counsel just didn't respond in a way that was satisfactory to this particular trustee. According to the trustee, you know, gave half answers or insufficient answers, evasive answers, etc., etc. Trustee files motion, a motion to, with, uh, to compel compliance with his discovery demands, then changes his mind, just files a motion for summary judgment. Uh, court grants, uh, the defendant actually defends with an affidavit uh, that apparently contradicts an earlier sworn statement, and the judge grants partial summary judgment motion. Um, and uh, a motion to and grants a motion to strike that the affidavit, uh, but that's only partial. So there's still a trial to be had. Trustee files two motions in limine, saying that the court should exclude evidence um, uh, because of uh, discovery violations and evidence that was uh, requested but not uh, provided for. Defendant, uh, I'm sorry, the court granted motion in limine. Eventually, the trustee moves for sanctions against the defendant and his attorney uh, based on his allegation that uh, the defendant made misrepresentations, didn't disclose um, certain property, and probably worst of all, accused the trustee and his counsel of churning and uh, just attempting to uh, uh, run up the hours. Shocking. Anyway, I think that's what motivated the trustee because apparently this allegation was made in open court. Not good. So, uh, was the defendant's conduct sanctionable uh, or should the trustee, I mean, so, not the trustee, should the court, if the trustee's motion is denied for sanctions under 37, FRCP 37, should the court just go ahead and issue the court's uh, own ruling on, on sanctions sua sponte? I included 37 because there's an allegation of violation of Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 37 as applied in the bankruptcy rules. Failure to disclose, failure to supplement, not playing the game according to the rules. Well, the trustee made his arguments that I've already cited well in the court's ruling the courts the court noted hey didn't follow proper procedure you're supposed to serve a motion for sanctions they need to give them a shot to cure uh, uh, their reprehensible behavior alleged reprehensible behavior they get 21 days and if if they still haven't cured and uh, continue with that conduct uh, then you file a motion but that wasn't done the court said, despite that, uh, I could still issue sanctions on my own. And the court concluded that yes, uh, sanctions are sanctions are appropriate. This is not looking good. If I were the defendant sitting in that courtroom, uh, I would not be happy. The court went on. It's a pattern here, a pattern of not providing information uh, and then providing it later and waffling 
and after careful consideration, uh, uh, the court issued a very stern warning, uh, saying that uh, it's not going to tolerate this kind of conduct. However, the court declined to impose uh, sanctions under uh, 9011. You dodged a bullet. The court basically said he's not going to impose sanctions because uh, he told the trustee that uh, he would consider the sanctions at trial and the trustee trustee should have presented evidence of damages and the uh, trustee didn't uh, provide any evidence. I guess he forgot. So the trustee cannot determine what the reasonable expenses are and therefore the motion is denied. And he's not going to sue a sponte issue of sanctions because he doesn't know what he, he doesn't have any numbers. He doesn't know what to sanction, how much the sanction. I'm sure the trustee was kicking himself at that point. Takeaway here is um, discovery violations can be sanctioned both under under FRCP 37. The slide doesn't refer to bankruptcy rule 37, but it's, I believe identical. And 9011. So it can be sanctioned a number of different ways. I think the other takeaway, if you're going to ask for sanctions, then submit some evidence, submit an invoice. How much does this cost? Otherwise, you're not going to get you're not going to get any actual money.